Welcome to the Kimi Mana Bay. Understanding the Beehive Jive? This is episode 134 of our beekeeping podcast. This week we are talking to Paul and Tracy from London. That's right, and we are Gary and Margaret, and we love honeybees. We are Kiwi Mana, and we are beekeepers who live in the Waitaki Ranges on the wild west coast of Auckland in New Zealand. Yes, that's the the North Island of New Zealand. And Kiwi Mana is a place where the beekeeping community can share a conversation and connect. We also, as if that wasn't enough, build and sell beekeeping supplies. We teach beginner beekeepers and provide beekeeper services and advice. And we are the Bees Knees Club Facebook group. And Happy New Year, everybody. Yeah, Happy New Year, guys. 2019, what's it going to bring for you? Lots more of this because I love this. (laughs) That's right. And great to have you joining us. We know life is busy. So we appreciate you've taken the time to join us today on your commute to work or in your your car or wherever you are today. On your road trip, eh, Gary? Road trip. Thanks so much for being part of the Kiwimana Buzz. And this podcast was made possible thanks to our patrons, especially this month. We would like to thank Malcolm T. Sanford. Malcolm has been supporting the Kiwimana Buzz since February 2018. Awesome. That's fantastic, Malcolm. And check out Malcolm's amazing beekeeping newsletter called Apis Information Resource News. And the link will be in the show notes. And the show notes for this one will be kiwi.bz slash jive. Awesome. So this is a great pair of beekeepers who have a really good conversation discussing what they're up to in their beekeeping, eh? Absolutely. And this interview was recorded back in August 2018, last year now. Gosh, (laughs) time flies when you're having bees. Okay, so who are the hosts of the Beehive Jive, Gary? Well, let me tell you. Paul and Tracy are beekeeping friends from South London, and they are the hosts of the Beehive Jive podcast. Okay, let's get into the interview. Tell us about the Croydon Beekeeping Association. Oldest in London. Yes, it is, 1879. I think the first two associations were us and Wimbledon, or actually, no, we were one of the first, but us and Wimbledon founded the National Honey Show. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean. That is true, which is why we've got that rivalry with Wimbledon about that cup. Is it the Horse Good Cup? Which, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I contribute zero to. Well, you drove me to the National Honey Show. That was contributing. So every, year, every year at the National Honey Show, there's this cup and... Uh, so when you, you submit a, an entry, so it could be wax, paint a picture, bake a cake, honey, and they add all the points up, and the ones that get the most points out of Wimbledon and Croydon win the cup. And I think, how many times have we won it? We've won it for the last 20 years, I think, basically. But a couple of years ago, or was it last year, they made a mistake and they counted the points incorrectly, so it <laughs> got engraved as Wimbledon winning. And, of course, it caused a massive... <laughs> It was so funny because they were all like, ha ha. And um, anyway, then when they re added the points, they'd made a mistake and it actually was ours. It's just, it's one of those many funny things that, you know, in beekeeping, it's such a funny, it's like being in Lord of the Rings sometimes, you know, it's just like some fantasy, funny little world. And, you know, the first time I did a honey show, you win something and you get 50p as your prize money. <laughs> It's just, just but you so enter, funny. Don't you? you enter. I can't I enter. Do. I'm just yeah. too lazy to enter. It's like I got I, like this year. I got honey. I don't normally get honey. Much to uh, my wife next door gets very annoyed. It's like mm, you spend all that money, you spend all that time. Where's my bloody honey? I got <laughs> which is I, fair enough. I fair think enough. I've got honey this year, and so it's sitting in there in jars. It's like you can ent- enter into a competition, which all it means is I have to put a label on it. Like, no. <laughs> no. Yeah, I, I don't bother either. It's just crazy. Your man, see I'll do it for you. I'll do all the show prep if you want to put two in. I've got, I've got wax because you're the wax guru, aren't you? <clears throat> I would like to be the wax guru. Gary, have you ever been to the National Honey Show? No, I've never been there. It's a, it's a big deal. Like it's the focus of the whole beekeeping world at this time of year here. Absolutely great. And last year they had speakers like Tom Seeley and lots of his researchers. They just did the most wonderful talks it was great wasn't it yeah it's the first time i went and mm. uh, it's yeah I, 
I thought it was really good. Tom Seeley was great. He was very, very nice, charming. I'm a massive fan. He signed our books, and he, every time he signs the book, he draws a little bee. <laughs> really cool. <laughs> and there's this huge queue of people waiting for their books to be signed, but he sits there and draws yeah. a little bee. Takes a time fan. on every book. I've got the bee hunting book he did because I've got, I've got the, I made myself a bee hunting box. Looks like your smoker. It looks like it's been run over by a truck. <laughs> I'm going to whack you in a minute. <laughs> with your smoke. <laughs> yeah, with my smoke, yeah. Oh, no, I've, I've got one of those bee hunting boxes too. They're good. Did you make one? Yeah. yeah. I've not done it yet. I've got the gear. I kind of, I want to go out and do it because it looks, it just looks like a good day out. It takes ages. Yeah. yeah. Well, I suspect if I do it around here, I'm just going to get, catch Margaret's bees. And she's sort of five houses down from where I live. And she's got Joyce. bees. And Joyce. And she's <clears> got bees in her back garden. <clears throat> oh, no, because I love really good handwriting. Would. Joyce is really good with their six legs at once. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. You, you've got to go somewhere that there's no bees around, which is pretty. I'd say it's pretty rare in England, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. There are a lot of bumble and solitaries. Oh, you catch them. You catch honeybees. Oh yeah. But if you catch you? you catch them from someone's hive in the back garden, it kind of you want to find bees up a tree, don't you? Not bees in someone's Langstroth hive in the back of their garden, <laughs> looking yeah. over the fence. Okay. <laughs> Do you know, I was talking to someone the other day. I run like hive tours, which I call bee safaris at the place where I work. And I was talking to a woman from Perth who said that in Australia, not in Scotland, and who said that she couldn't believe uh, the number of bumblebees in the UK and that they didn't have many bumblebees in Perth. And there was a New Zealand woman who said the same. And I, I didn't know that. I thought we'd brought back species of bumblebee from New Zealand and ah, well, reintroduced them on the Isle of Wight or something. You need to read Dave Bolson's book. Those bees were introduced from the UK to New to Zealand. To New Zealand. Yeah. And that bee stinked in the UK and they went and caught it and brought it back. Oh, I see. So it was the same yeah. genetic. Bum- English bumblebees in particular are mm. massively invasive in mm. North America. They wiped out <laughs> entire species of other bumblebees. Excellent. But in, uh, I think they put them in New Zealand for the clover to feed the cattle. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think they've got them in parts of Australia. No. Because like, we had a guy come over from uh, Melbourne, and he, he, he couldn't believe, he could, he needed, he'd never seen one before. That's Bumblebee. amazing. I can't imagine. Have you never read any of Dave Gilson's, like, Stinging the no. Tail? Oh, I've got them upstairs. They're amazing books. I'll lend you one of them. They're really. Thank you. He, so he founded the Bumblebee Trust. Oh, of course. Okay. I've never read any of his books, but yeah, I know who he is. He writes a lot of articles on neonicotoids. Yeah. Yeah, he he does. does. And with a passion. (laughs) Yeah, well, and looks like he's right too. Yeah, I think he is right. Had a few people on our show about them. Yeah, shocking. Well, they've outlawed me. I haven't noticed. I mean, we don't have massive colony nonsense over here. I think if you lose colonies over here, it's normally to things other than pesticides. It's normally to proa the dam. It's the combination, isn't it? Yeah. Definitely. They're probably weakened by it, but I think it's the strength. They did a field study where they, because they couldn't work out why when they fed neonicotoids in labs, they got one result. And then when they put them in the field, an actual mm. field, they got different results. And their study said that it's because in the field they had more resources. So basically the bees were working harder to overcome the consequence of pesticides. So if you've already gone working harder and then you, you layer on things like varroa on top of that, <clears throat> they're kind of mm. in trouble. Yeah, I think that's what it does. I think it weakens their immune system. You know, makes them less more susceptible to disease and stuff. Yeah, it's just more stress, I think. And I think the thing we don't have here in the UK that, you know, you certainly have in the States and I'm not sure about Australia and New Zealand, but it's migratory beekeeping. I've seen the bees in, in California in the almond orchards and the stress they go through and the chemicals that are whacked on them. Because, of course, they, they still spray the blossom while the bees are working. You know, it's, it's not surprising at all when you see that kind of thing, that, you know, being lost. So, I mean, you know, we're such it's, – it's funny here because we're so, so small scale compared to other countries. And the vast majority of beehives in this country are owned by hobbyists yeah. like us. You know, there are only probably two or three major commercial beekeepers. It's funny because you'll follow – in quotes, hobby beekeepers on social media. And a hobby beekeeper in the UK might have, a big one might have 20, 30 hives. And you'll follow a hobby keeper in the US, a hobby keeper and a got 100. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, okay. It's yeah. Completely different. I know, it's funny, isn't it? 
because I take myself so seriously because all my beekeeping gigs and I've got like less than 20 colonies. Funny. I wish I had more. Oh, I think 20 is a good number. Yeah. I mean, mm. 20 is enough to keep you busy. I think more than that, it's, it's a second job. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Well, we had 30 at one point and it was too much. Mm. Yeah. Especially in the summer when they're starting to grow and then you've got to keep them in a box and or split them and it's just a lot of work. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what got you guys started in beekeeping then? What got me started was growing up in Australia, where I lived in Queensland, you did not buy honey from a supermarket. You bought your honey from the beekeeper on the corner. And I remember when I was about five years old, I was just fascinated. I just couldn't believe it. You know, the white and the smoke and all that kind of stuff. So I was always interested. And I think I just always wanted to get to a point where I could have some. So I finally got a house with a garden here in South London. And and that was it. I, I, it's always, always something I've wanted to do. I just love it. How about you, Paul? Well, I, at the time, I was working for an IT company at their labs, and uh, they decided, a big American IT company, decided they, uh, they were going to put bees on the roof. So they were running free beekeeping courses. And I thought, that is a really cool thing. But I didn't really fancy the two-hour drive each way <laughs> to that lab to do the course. So I went on Google, and I found three associations within sort of 20 minutes from where I live. There's Bromley and Epsom and Croydon. UK is really lucky. They've got very strong beekeeping associations. Pretty much wherever you live, there's one on your doorstep. And they're run by lots of very sort of committed. And it's, being, a, being volunteers is always a, there's a little bit of, you know, argy <laughs> they're, they're run by very Definitely, committed yeah. volunteers. And they're really supportive. So I found, a, I went to Croydon. I did a free, I think it was a six or eight week course. They helped me, you know, this, the, the, I got my first swarm of bees was someone's garden and Mark, who was the chairman at the time, came out and yeah. uh, helped me catch them. I put them on the, the club training apiary where sort of the apiary managers and things would help me. It was really supportive. And it, I think without that, I wouldn't be beekeeping. I would have got a book. That's very true. Put some bees in a box. They would yeah. have died. I would have gone, oh, <laughs> that's, yeah. that's rubbish and stuff. So I think the association method in, in England is really, really powerful. And if you mm. get into it, I mean... How many beginners do they? So Croydon's not massive, but how many beginners do they take? They take. I mean, you you do the the basic course, don't you? Yeah. So I, I teach a course which prepares people to do the basic assessment, which is the first exam of the British Beekeepers Association. So I don't I don't know if it's like this in New Zealand, but over here there's a system of beekeeping exams that you can go through, just like if you were learning the piano or the violin or something. So. <laughs> It's well, it's it's funny because I did learn the piano and actually teaching the piano and those exams, it's very much like that with the beekeeping. You know, every year we put six people through that in our area. I mean, we're technically in Surrey, we're South London, but we're kind of South London, South London, over the border into Surrey. You know, we're kind of, how shall I put this? We're kind of like the poor relative of the other Surrey associations, because you have some very wealthy areas. They have amazing facilities and they've got microscope rooms and they've got like everything, extraction rooms. And, you know, ours is a little rickety shed, not an allotment. And yet still we manage to get people through the exams. We manage to get people coming along. And I think Paul's absolutely right. Actually, I wouldn't still be doing it if it wasn't for Croydon as well, because, yeah, like you said, our chairman Mark on his bicycle would cycle anywhere anywhere with his bee kit on you know to help you get a swarm down or something he was just brilliant it's about having that ongoing support isn't it because you know the impetus to do something is one thing but the kind of like stamina to keep carrying it on you need help you need people to help you i wouldn't be beekeeping it wasn't for me people (laughs) (laughs) and i think it's good to go somewhere that everyone's taught knows what bees are and doesn't you know ask the obvious questions you know what i mean so they've got Somewhere to bounce ideas off. You know, the, the usual public is how, how often it gets stung. And the good yeah. thing is we've got some very experienced, like very, there's people that have been keeping bees there for 40 years. And it's just interesting to sort of like, there is a, there is a type of beekeeper, uh, a before internet beekeeper and a after internet beekeeper. And a before internet beekeeper in sort of the mid 90s, Varroa landed. They all put uh, an apistan in their hives, killed all the varroa. Then the varroa became re- resistant to it. But those, those people have got a method. Do we, we do this, do this, treat then, do that. And then you've got the after internet mm. beekeepers who Google it. They'll find a sort of like, you know, 
treat them with green tea or something. And then you'll get sort of <laughs> one of these guys who's been treating bee, bees for 40 years and they'll just look at you and go, mm, maybe not. <laughs> and it's really good because you've got a mix, that sort of mix of different techniques and stand. And yeah. you, can, you can say, well, I think I'm doing this. And sometimes you'll get really robust, blunt, are you mad sort of feedback. And other times people go, yeah, I tried that. And it was, yeah, I, I love my association. They're, they're, That's they're nice. fantastic. Have you ever convinced those pre-internet beekeepers to listen to podcasts? I'm sure some of them do. I think some of them do, yeah. But they don't tell you they're listening. No. They only pass comments <laughs> <laughs> on what you've said, and that's how you know they've listened. But we're very honest with our podcast. Is We're a bit <laughs> This is our podcast. Except Tracy. Tracy. Tracy's a professional. No, we're not. We're, what, what, we, what we do <laughs> is say we really love our bees and we love beekeeping, but we're not experts. So... <laughs> We're just talking honestly about the things that happen to us. Parables. Parables. <laughs> Be keeping parables. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but that, that's why people love your podcast, isn't it? Because it's just it's just like listening in on yeah. a conversation about bees. You know, that, that's that's the beauty of it. I mean, you know this, right? One of the the fears when you podcast is people think you're you're kind of portraying yourself as this sort of experts and gurus, and we're very honest that. Uh, if you tell us, well, we do it a different way and it works better, mm. I'm going to try it because Absolutely. I want to be better. Yeah. And it's brilliant. I mean, on the internet, some brilliant resources. I mean, I've, there's certain videos I watch over and over again. So, for example, the Mike Palmer National Honey Show, Sustainable Apiary, which is an hour, which is worth an hour of any beekeeper's time because I, I use his method. I use the overwintered nukes method and it transformed the way I keep bees. Like now we went we, we went and looked at our bees this my bees today. We look at each other's bees and I'm in a good place now because winter's coming, I've got nukes that are overwintered, I've got production colonies that are overwintered. And that's all based on you know, Mike Palmer's thing, like try and overwinter one nuke per production colony, because any of them die, you're still gonna have the same amount of production. It's just mm. there's loads of resources on the internet. Chaff as well, you have to work your way yeah. through. He keeps promising to write a book and he needs to Wish he would write it. Because he, he was down here last year um, fishing. Oh, was he? Oh, cool. Oh, he's, he's, I really enjoy his stuff. And then uh, I like Tom Seeley stuff. That's interesting. He's a storyteller. I love Honey Bee Democracy. It's awesome. Yeah. He did the, um, we went to his talk. He did the bees as a honey factory when he was explaining how yeah. bees make honey. Yeah. In terms of a, the factory floor. Factory, yeah. And, the, you know, the forage is coming in. There have to be house bees to receive that nectar. And if there aren't, what the bees do about it, you know, how they run around shaking bees and waking them up and, and you know, stopping waggle dancers. It, it, was, it was absolutely fascinating. I, I do think he's a wonderful storyteller. He, he, and then he kind of introduces you to these concepts which feel like, you know, it's kind of like, I can't remember what it was, but it was something, it felt almost Stephen Hawking's-like in its scope. <laughs> you know, what if... And, and it would be hanging there. Yeah. Um. I I love him. I really love. <laughs> I really love Tom. He is good. He's really good. You you're, you specialize in um, keeping angry bees, eh, Tracy? <laughs> <laughs> See what you've done to my reputation. I hope you're happy. <laughs> my my. All I will say is this: <laughs> my bees are perfectly behaved for me. When you're not there. <laughs> When you're not there, they're out there, perfectly behaved. But they're perfectly I, set, you know, because no, no one's going to try and steal them, are they? Well, well, I mean, that is one aspect of it. I'm busy they try to steal my car. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the story about that? Because you said that uh, your um, Tracy's bee stole your car. Really? Well, no, it's just, it's just they. He's saying quite, they're thugs. They're thugs. <laughs> yeah. And, they're not. No, they were. You got. You bought. Was it Buckfast bees? Oh yeah, I did. I did have a Buckfast incident. Yeah, and then after about a, a second generation, second Buckfast generation, they, they weren't friendly. They see you come in and come out and meet you, <laughs> and it wasn't oh, a friendly okay. meet. That's what happened to my smoker. It wasn't like we were in Hawaii and they put the put the garden the flowers around your neck. They were like, "What are you doing in this estate? Get yeah. out!" <laughs> it was. I don't know if it's. It, there was this real kind of fashion here about five years ago for everyone to buy Buckfast queens. They're so prolific and, you know, your colonies build up beautifully. But then, of course, get to the second generation, you've got some massive temperament issues. I did have those in my bees, it's true. That was when I first learnt how, oh, my God, culling a queen, how it changes the temperament. 
<laughs> straight away. <laughs> you cut them. That, you you turned I, into a, a real sort of <laughs> mercenary. <laughs> very selective now, aren't you? You'll be. Yeah. Oh yeah. Actually, it did teach me that. And Roger Patterson. Do you know him? He had Roger. Yeah. Like, have you oh yeah okay great. so he taught me you know basically how de- let's demystify all of this thing about breeding and everything if you select queen cells you are a breeder therefore you know do it do it right so he kind of yeah helped me to not be so frightened of culling a queen here and there and and actually my bees i would say oh god i feel like i have to defend them now um <laughs> they really i think they they're really actually good bees I think they're good they're bees. Very, your bees are very prolific. Very, yeah. Very prolific. Very productive. They only, sti- they only sting you and Mark. No, no, they only sting Mark because Mark won't wear a bee suit. Okay, yeah. They only, oh, sting, they? They only sting me because you know, I'm inspecting your hives. Okay, well, they're taking the tyres off your car. When they're taking the tyres yeah. off my car and stealing the radio. <laughs> it could be because they don't recognise you, Paul, because they, they do recognise faces, don't they? He's that weird chubby English <laughs> bloke, let's sting him. <laughs> I, no, no. Actually, they don't sting you. You've looked at them. No, I've looked quite at them a there. few times. Actually, I, I, to be, I know it to you. They've calmed down. When the first time I met them, <laughs> we moved them, didn't we? We moved them. You had them on one side of the yeah, that's right. field, yeah. And they would turn into a car park or something. So we had to move them, and they <laughs> were really. They were. They weren't happy about it. They weren't happy when you turned up. It wasn't even you were moving them, no, so you no, turned no, up, no. and they came out to say hello. But I mean, because you do those bee safaris, you'd, you'd have to have calm bees for that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I have now, though, wouldn't you? I've got, I've got really calm bees, and I've worked out how to do the demonstration so that I start with a polynuke, and that's great because I know they're really calm bees. I know I can show them the queen and drones and whatever, and see how people react to the bees. And then I've got two other perfectly calm colonies. And people can't believe it. They say that they expect the bees to all fly out, you know, because these are people who've never seen inside a beehive before. And it's really, I like seeing people relax. They kind of start to, after the first one, they kind of go, oh, is that it? Okay. And then, you know, you take them onto a bigger one and then onto a bigger one. Yeah, no, so no stings at all. No. And if, what was it, 50, how many people you done that? 51. 51. And children as well. And including, yeah, exactly, children. It's been great. Well, we find that children don't have any natural fear of them, so they're really good. They just come along and stick their hand in and everything. I'm just so impressed with the kids. They're just a delight, actually, Yeah. because even if they pretend they're too cool for school at the beginning, they, they really get into it. They want to handle the combs. They want to you know, stick their head over the edge and look into the beehive to see where the bee gym is. You know, it's kind of, it's interesting. It's, I've really enjoyed doing it. It's been a real high point of my year. Your second season when you're a beekeeper, that's when it all sort of, because your first season you get bees somehow and they kind of make it to the winter. And I, and I, I overfed mine so much. It was just, uh, my, my hive was literally just a block of yeah. sugar. Uh, but the second season, that's when you first get, I think, a full box of bees it's yeah. a bit of a shock you take the lid off and all you can see is bees, is bees yeah yeah and, and the second yeah. season is when i think when the, the rubber beats the road yeah it's, it's easy keeping a, a nuke of bees isn't it but when you've got like four or five boxes yeah you got a nuke you put it in a hive and it kind of over over summer it grows but it doesn't really want to swarm because it's still and okay and then that over winters and then into april may you just where have all these bees come from? You open up, where yeah. the hell have all these bees come Yeah. <laughs> and that's, um, and that's where the association come in because mm. I, I, I was always, I remember doing inspection with David Shepard, who's our AP manager. Yeah, that's Alexa helping out. Yeah, you know, he's running through this big box of bees barehanded. And I'm still, every time I open a box of bees, they were trying to kill me and I couldn't work out how he was doing that. And I've realized that he got stung so many times that he's kind of just worked out not, not to do. I think that's yeah. actually yeah. second season kind of starts, you start to think, okay, I need a, I need some sort of mech. I need a method yeah. to deal with these bees. It is scary. And do you know, actually, I I'd think. I've scared uh, by beehives when I started. I, do you know, I, I had a beehive. I had a hive at the field, with all yours, really. which was, it actually did. It didn't frighten me, but I felt really uneasy with it. They were really horrible, horrible bees. And Really? Oh, shock. They, were, <laughs> they were pains bees, actually, but something went wrong. 
they went wrong in the jeans. You mixed them with the wrong crowd. <laughs> <laughs> you mixed them with a bunch of thugs. <laughs> And Mark had to come down and help me try to find the queen, which, I mean, you know, forget it in a hive like that. That was awful. But, yeah, that's why I feel like in the podcast and also in the blogs, I want to kind of encourage beginners as much as I can. You know, if you don't have an association near you or something, or it's it's just – it's not even that. It's just reassuring to know that we we make the same mistakes. We all do it, and it doesn't mean that you should give up, you know. That's important. Yeah, I think I think that's that people love that eh, about the podcast and stuff. You can they can listen to our mistakes as well and hear what we do yeah. wrong and stuff. Yeah. So you said there a bit. You've got. Do you use bee gems in your hives? I've got one. What do you What do you think of it? Well, that's a really good question. <laughs> I go regularly. Um, I think that. Well, the bees. I forgot it was in there, hmm. and. I had to dismantle that colony for various reasons. When I got down and I saw it there, of course, I was surprised that it was so clean and shiny. There were bees all over it. Oh, okay. So all I can say is there were bees all over it. And the only other thing I can say is that that colony has very low varroa. Oh, right. So is that an endorsement? Well, no, because (laughs) it could be completely coincidental. They were definitely using it. Now, I couldn't see them flipping any Varroa mites off their thorax or anything like that. They're all over it, and they have a low Varroa count. Ah, oh, just blast with oxalic. Yeah, we, that, that'd be you with your the little <laughs> things that you've drilled. Do you use a vaporizer or is it, what do you call it? It's sub- sublimation, don't you? In I've worked my way through a range of uh, oxalic toys. So I, I, I start with a trickle. That's a very common technique in the mm. uh, UK, the... the Boxing, traditionally, you go down on Boxing Day, you crack the hive, and then you just trickle in uh, five minute sugar in and uh, sugar solution with oxalic mixed in on the bees. Did that. Then I went, then I bought one of those vaporizers, and they're good. I just found. Was, is that oh, like the plate? Yes, yeah, like right. a heated plate. The only thing I found with those is it, they take an awful long time. So you have to take about 10 minutes a hive, and it's like, and why it's happening? If you've got like six hives, you can be there all like an hour. So then I had a birthday. And I got myself a sublimator, my my, my Varroa cannon. And that thing's amazing. You can do, I can do, <laughs> I could do, <laughs> I could do like ten hives in twenty minutes because it takes about two or three minutes a hive. Does it like throw out a, a like a, a stream of exotic smoke and stuff? Is that what it does? Yeah. So you you put the so it's a heated plate and there's a plastic cup. And what you do, you turn the plate upside down. You put how much oxalic you want in the plastic cup. You screw it in, and then you turn it over, and the oxalic falls on the oh, yeah. plate, vaporizes, sublimates, juice, yeah. instantly. instantly yeah. And then it's just pushed out a spout. So you put it in the you, – you, what you do is you put it, put the spout in the hive with the tool upside down, then you turn it the right way up, and it just activates. It's a massive cloud of – yeah, and it just sublimates the whole hive. And so the University of Sussex here has got um, Lassie, Lassie, they call it. They, they do bee research – and they found that it was 99% effective. Although you've got to be careful, though, because if you read the paper, and Liz Nee told me this, so this isn't my knowledge, the way they did it was they scraped, they went through, they opened the hive every day, every week, throughout the year, snow, rain, whatever, and they scrape all the brood out, mm. and then they treat it. Mm. So what I do is, if I think there's brood in there, I do four treatments five days apart. So hopefully I get a whole brood cycle. That's what we do too, yeah. The Varroa Cannon is a – well, you the, used it, didn't you? I did. I, I mean, I, I loved it. I think but the thing is you've got like the proper face mask for it <laughs> because I I didn't realise that you're standing in the vapour. Yeah, you don't want to breathe it in. <laughs> no. See, I, I thought I could just kind of, you know, turn my head away yeah. and hold it like this. But, no, it was like all over me. Yeah. I mean, I got – I had really good results from using that. No, you've definitely got to have a mask for those ones, though. Even the vaporizer one. Yeah. I was talking to someone, they said, oh, well, I get a bit of a whiff. I said, well, if you can smell it, you're breathing it into your lungs. You don't want that stuff in your lungs. No, it can damage your lungs, can't it? Yeah. Mm. So I've got a full mask. I'm... I know, you're you're sorted with that mask. Yeah, I That's like my great. lungs, the shape they are. <laughs> Go deep sea diving and that. <laughs> I think you need that, but, eh, with those with those commercial ones, they're really... They just spit out. It's like a flamethrower, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. They, they fill. I mean, I, I I run. I guess double mediums. I guess in Langstroth size. So I run those, 
So that's two, that's about, I can't remember, about 10 grams of the stuff. And it's whole cloud. It's just, I mean, it, you seal the hive and it still finds cracks. And it just pours out. You'll stand in this cloud of smoke. But I put the bottom boards in and it's really, you take them out after, like after you sort of pack up, open up, you just mm. see all these dead varroa. It just wipes yeah. them out. It's fantastic stuff. But see, the problem I have with it is that it's not licensed. That that method is not licensed. You have with it. That I have with it yeah. because if any trace was ever found in the honey I sell, mm. then that's yeah. a real problem for me. Oh, so that's not licensed in England yet? No. The only there well there is one that's licensed for I sublimation. Think, but it's got it's not for it's got sugar in it though. It's got so it, it I wouldn't yeah. put it in the sublimator because you couldn't use it in yours. It camera, no, it camerized the pan. Yeah. But apparently you can use it on a plate. Can you? Yeah. I will. But I don't, <laughs> I, I don't believe that because it would be toffee. So really people use that with the trickle method. Yeah, it's just an issue because, I don't know, like, you know, I'm... You sell your honey wholesale, though. I, you actually sell your honey. I don't sell my honey. Yeah, that's, that, that, that's all it is. That's literally all it is. And also because I'm, I'm doing an exam next year, the general husbandry exam, it's called. I had to go to a, like a training weekend for that. And they were all saying, if you use this in your hives, don't tell the examiners that you do. <laughs> and the people who were saying that were the examiners because it's not licensed by the government. No. I, think, I think the reason they haven't licensed it is quite expensive. To, you have to license it as a, a veterinary medicine and it's quite expensive. To get it there. Yeah. And I think the people licensing it don't want to license a generic, I mean, oxalic, dehydrate you can buy it mm -hmm. like 10 kilos for about two pounds two pounds <laughs> yeah. it's really cheap and i think the problem is that once it's licensed anybody can sell it because you need none so the api bioxal is which is a licensed one is oxalic with some additives so it's, yeah. a, it's a recipe they've licensed that recipe and not oxalic mm. yeah but it works. it's mean, it a works. shame because if it, it works brilliantly and everyone uses it but it's kind of like well I just have to pretend I'm not using it. But it's it's my honey. That's my thing is that, you know, part of my beekeeping gig is that I've got to give them honey. And if that was tested, as honey is here in the UK, randomly, then it could be a problem for me. But, yeah, I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do this winter. I have to think about it. Not yeah. sell honey. <laughs> you sold it all. Every last jar. Every last drop. That's mm. awesome. The recent heat wave in the UK, has it affected your bees at all? Me, massively. <laughs> we were just talking about this in our podcast. So my bees, have, my lavender bees have been on that field for five years and I know the patterns and the rhythms and what happens. This year, the main flow ended the first week of July, which is unheard of, about four weeks before it should have because of the heat, just, you know, drying up all the nectar. Uh, the bees got very hot. Some queens went off lay. I lost one queen, which I'm actually putting that down to heat. It was a hive in full sun. I mean, it was really hot here. Like, even speaking as an Australian, it was proper. <laughs> speaking as an Aussie, <laughs> it was proper hot here. It was really hot. You know, I just kind of, I've never had to think about what bees do in heat. And people were losing bees here. So the main effect it had was on the honey for me, unfortunately. Did you get less rain because of the heat? Got no rain. It was a drought, yeah. a technical drought. It was weird because uh, in April and May, it was winter. It was it was, you know, it was snowing and sleeting. And then they had this heat wave, and it didn't rain for two or three months. It's raining now, obviously. It's, mm. it's England. It's going to rain at some point. I mean, how many – you telling me you did like half as many. You normally do six to 800 jobs. Yeah. Days, or 300. Yeah, like nearly 400. Yeah. Yeah. That's all. I can't believe it. That's, That's nothing. <laughs> oh, okay. Then. It's, I, it's, it's such a shock. But yeah. it's great for queen mating. Mm. It's great because normally when you're mating queens, like you start queen, I start queen in end of April to get them mm. out mating in, into the middle of May. And it's raining or windy and they get lost, get run over. Here, this year, they pretty much. Yeah, it was ideal. Wasn't bar it? one or two of them, they've all mated because it was just hot and dry, and no wind, no rain. No, it's been really still, actually. That's interesting. I mean, it has been just the most amazing summer for us humans. <laughs> 
mind you, there are some people here who always complain about the weather. It doesn't matter what it's doing. Yeah, you. Not me. <laughs> Isn't that a national pastime in England? It is. It is. And but I understand why it's they're like that. Why We're trying to get into like the Olympics, is it? Because <laughs> <laughs> the weather here is so unpredictable and crazy that you can't help but be obsessed by it and what it's doing. And when you become a beekeeper, you know, you, you find you, I've got about six weather apps on my phone <laughs> so I can see, you know, what's going to be the right one. I've, I've got a radar app on my phone so I know when the <laughs> rain's coming to my apron. You know, you look at the radar and you can predict when it's going to start raining. Mm, I think it has affected the bees, the heat, definitely. It's good for your bee safaris though, wasn't it? Great for my bee safaris. But I haven't opened the bees as much as I normally would because it's been so hot. And because the flow dried up, that the robbing has been a real problem. And when I, I did go and, you know, do some quick checks, the boxes are so light, there's nothing in there. You know, so I've had to feed them quite early. At the beginning of the summer, I was talking to uh, one of the commercial beekeepers and he said, we're worried that everything is just going to like pop and bloom at the same time and there won't be a succession of forage. And that was absolutely what happened. He got it absolutely right. Because even things like blackberry, which should, you know, the bees could still be working those now. They're all dead. Their berries are dead and everything. Tracy, you said you lost the queen, so can you explain your funeral process for the queens? <laughs> <laughs> Please listen to all of them and take a note. No, actually, I did have a thought about a, a, an extra ceremony I could add. Really? To that. Like a cemetery. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a little queen burial ground. If I'd found her, I would have, well, practiced marking and clipping her first. I like to do that on bees that are dead or are about to die. I like to, you know, practice those things. Well, you're about to kill. That's the main cause of bee deaths in your... Culling is the main cause of bee. Or me dropping bees. God. Oh, dropping yeah. Dropping flipping them. Oh, I dropped one this year and I lost her. I like to, what can I say? I like to honour what they've done, even if they've been crap and there's not much of it. You know, I like to just lay them to rest. You put them under a little flower. And let a frog eat them or something. <laughs> You know, back, you did, back into the earth. You did teach me about selection, though. Because I, I, I couldn't work out. Well, so I'd go and see Tracy's bees, and you'd open them up, and they're just – it's like you take three hives and pour them into one. There's bees everywhere. And it's because you're so selective. It's The moment you think, that queen's not very good, she gets a chop and yeah, they replace it. her with a one yeah. that is – and that's open mating as well. It's not just mating with other queens around there. So I think, yeah, you. I took that from you, that – because I'm a real wimp, so I've I got I had, really. I've had queens. You you keep them all tucked up and just like let them live out their lives. I'm like offering Kirsty. I like to retire. I know them you do. Little, little nuke. They have their own little home. house and everything. You move them in. You're way too nice. <laughs> yeah, oh, I'm I'm like that too. You baby. Oh. Uh, so look, Tracy's looking at us in disgust. <laughs> <laughs> you have hives that just they produce nothing. Hey. I had a queen yeah. for three years. My blue queen. She's gone now. I think. Oh, I, is she I gone? think the wasps robbed her out. I just, mm. But she, uh, she was always there. They never swarmed. They never superseded. And she would stop laying for weeks at a time, and then start again. And so you'd go, oh, "I'm going to get rid of that queen." And the next time you open it, it's full of brood. Oh, great! And then it would stop. I think oh, the queen's gone. No, there she is. Mm. <laughs> and I kept that queen for three years in a hive, feeding, and, and then now I kind of look back and think, well, she is. <laughs> it's hard as a bee because because I think when you start as a beekeeper, you're just paranoid they're um, going to die. You're yeah. absolutely obsessed with the queen's going. I'm going to lose a queen if you don't see the queen in every inspection. You're like, oh, now I kind of I'm a bit more. Yeah. Now I look because well, you've got enough bees yeah. that if something's happened to the queen, it's no big deal. And I, I think that's the importance of learning how to increase. That's a Roger Patterson thing. You got to increase. Yeah. And once you've got, you know, if I'm I'm looking at, like this week, I've got what, 12, 14 hives on that apiary. We went through the boxes today and there's two there that this time of year have weirdly decided they're going to make new queens. Mm. Years ago, I would have freaked out because I think, oh, there's no drones, they're not going to make. And now I kind of look down, well, I've got 10 other hives and next year I can make another yeah. 40 queens. I don't, fine, do it, try it, yeah. guys. And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. And I think that's, in the UK, I don't know what it's like in New Zealand, but in the UK, we don't teach new beekeepers how to increase we teach them how to do swarm control but we don't so we teach them how to do it like a packed and split but we don't teach them what to do with queen cells yeah 
And that was a big, I went on a course with a company called Tiger Bees, really, Queen Reading course, really good course. And and the kind of, on, while you're doing that course, which was a grafting course, right? But it was like, every time you see a queen cell, it's an opportunity to get another colony. And that's not really taught here. It's kind of, every time you see a queen cell, freak out. Yeah, and freak out and, and get rid of it, knock it down. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, it's such a waste, yeah. though. It, it is such a waste. And, you know, that's, I think, Roger, that was a real turning point for me, hearing his yeah. his lecture on that. So I, I cut them out now if I see them. If I want that hive, if I want that queen, and I see queen cells, like, great, I'm going to Yeah, I know, you're like. <laughs> I'm going to take that. I'm going to cut them out and push them in another. I know, but you've got to be, you've got to be ruthless in getting rid of, you know, in getting rid of the ones that some some queens only breed, some hives only make bees. They don't make honey. <laughs> And I'm not interested in that. So, you know, I want interesting hives. But as Liz was saying when we interviewed her, you've just got to be aware of what you're breeding out as well as what you're breeding in when you choose. So, and, and I, I've come to the point where I've been doing this for a long time now. I need to start thinking, do I, you know, what am I losing when I make these choices? Yeah. What gene am I losing? So, but, yeah, no, it has worked me well. And, I will continue to honour my dead queens <laughs> that I have just killed. Um, if you were near a lake, I swear you'd have a, like a Viking burial. You would send it out <laughs> the lake and set light to it. do that. Yeah. yeah. Do you play a song or anything, or what do you, what do, you do? Oh, no. That is a great idea, though. I yeah. should. I should I, what about Honey, Honey, How You Thrill Me? <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. that, no. <laughs> She'll know why she's dead then. <laughs> no, Honey. <laughs> Oh, I think it's fantastic that you do that. You know, you, you should. <laughs> it's just when you've, killed, minutes, when you've killed a queen, you look at it and you think, crap, that's a queen I've just killed. And it's what you said. It's that thing when you start beekeeping, like you're terrified to even touch her, let alone pick her up and kill her. You know, so it's just like that thing of, oh, I will honour you with the fairies. <laughs> 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 it's, a, it's kind of one of those beekeeping epiphanies when you realise you're managing colonies of bees and not the queens. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. Realise quick charge. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Although people think she's in charge, she, she thinks she's like the queen, isn't she? And she's not really. Queen bee. Oh, I hate that. Yeah. You know, you get it on mobile phone covers and jewellery and handbags do you queen bee my handbag well, you, wouldn't, you wouldn't know would you um <laughs> what, what does your handbag have on paul lucky boy telly tubbies <laughs> <laughs> oh no I'm just, well, I'm, it's the one who has the handbag that's gonna flare up my bulimia now all oh, right you, you <laughs> shut it you know what i meant so tracy did you keep bees in australia when you were living there or was it, was it just for when, when you were in england no i've never kept bees in australia funnily enough so I've been keeping them for nine years, and it's all been here in Croydon. It's the funny. The centre of, of the world. Frankly, absolutely. <laughs> Every time I go home to see my family, I try to hook up with a local beekeeper. So my mum lives on the Gold Coast, so I've spent quite a lot of time with Gold Coast beekeepers over the years. And Can you bring back small high beetles? Yeah, or? yeah, not unintentionally, <laughs> but... um. I yeah, I, it was the small hive beetle that I wanted to see. Do you guys have? That? No, no, we don't yet. And you don't have varroa either, do you? Yeah, we have varroa. We just don't have small hive beetles. Uh, but Australia doesn't have varroa yet, eh? So they say. Not the varroa destructor, anyway. Right. Okay. There was an incursion of varroa Jacobson and up in Darwin, I think. Oh, and and one in Melbourne recently too. Yeah. Oh, th- no, I think the one in Melbourne was Destructor. Was it? Yeah, but they destroyed it. It was in a container, so I think they destroyed it. So I think it should be okay. I think if that gets to Australia, which it will when it gets to Australia, I think that's going to be a massive shock for Australian beekeepers. Yeah, it, I think it will. It is the single greatest challenge in beekeeping, and the rest of the world has been managing it for years, and Australia is going to have to come late to... I don't know. I think it's going to be really hard. I think, think they've got the advantage of all the education and tools and technique. I mean, we just spent talking about oxalic acid, which I don't know how who worked out that works. Yes. I, so they might have the benefit of coming in on the kind of crest of the wave, as so it were. The rest of us do. Just Google Randy Oliver. And go, yeah. Just do what he does. Yeah. 
they do manage small hive beetle, which I can't imagine ever having to, that's just a disgusting, awful thing. So I don't know. I really, I mean, I, I hope it doesn't happen, but it is, a, it's going to be a big deal. Oh, absolutely. And because the, they all talk about being, you know, organic and treatment free in Australia, and I go, well, that's easy without Vera. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, yeah, not, exactly. it's not rocket science to not treat when you've. In the UK, they grow in 19, I think it's 97 or 96. Before that, everyone was treatment free. Yeah. There's nothing to treat. No. <laughs> Apart from foul broods. Yeah, because when I talked to Roger Patterson, he said that they used to treat for foul brood and use stuff like that, antibiotics and stuff like that. Yeah, he used to yes. use, uh, yeah, and they got banned because um, obviously random treatment of antibiotics isn't really good when you want to use it to treat actual illnesses. Yeah. But how but do I you know, feel, wasn't it? They, when I first started beekeeping, that was still licensed. Yeah. Fumidil. You can yeah. get it. You can get it now. Um, there was a a commercial beaker in Scotland who got fined for using it. So he got foul brood in his colonies and the government agreed, as I understand it, the government agreed he could use it, but they were taking so long to actually source it. He just sourced it himself and treated it. So he had permission to do it, but he used to, he acquired it himself. Right. So they didn't like that. So they kind of he got in trouble for that, even though they said he could use it because he didn't wait for the original source. So you can use it. I mean, if you're a commercial beekeeper with 500, a thousand hives, the government's not going to let them all die. But obviously, if you've got 20, there's no way they're going to let you yeah. license to use it. And How if much foul brew do we get? Well, EFB is around. Wimbledon had EFB they? last year. But that was just – they just shook swarm that now and destroy everything. So you get you keep the bees, but all the hive bits. Destroy the wood. Yeah, but obviously, AFB, you have to kill them, then burn them. <laughs> yeah, so that's, that's what we do AFB here too. And uh, the bee inspector comes, the government bee inspector comes, and they stand there while you dig the hole. You have to dig a hole yeah. for your own hive, and they burn it. And they make you kill them as well. They watch while you kill them with petrol. Yeah. But EFB is rare, I think. I hope so. It's common here. Oh, is is it? it really? Do you treat it there, or is it? No, we burn the hives. Is that, do you think that's common because you've got so many beekeepers kind of riding the Manuka train, and they don't, some of them probably less. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, cowboys. Is the word? That's the word. <laughs> yeah, but um, it's quite quite common. And we had, I, I don't even listen to our podcast, but we, up the road we had a guy that had like 19 hives, and they, all of them, most of them had AFB, and he just abandoned them. Oh, nice. That's friendly. Oh, friendly. I, I know. Did, so did did you did your bees get it? No, no. Lucky they didn't. Mm. So I, I have had it in other apres, but not this one. Uh, we had another apiary which had it, so we had to destroy three hives about two years ago. So it's not fun. No, no. that's a shame. It's an expensive day. Yeah. Yeah, I, I bet. Hives yeah. aren't cheap, are they? No, no. no not at all. Mm. So what's the best way that people get in touch with you guys? Oh. Yeah, you can go to our website, which is the Beehive Dive. Uh, be Deep Dive. Beehive <laughs> Dive. Apiary <laughs> <Dive. laughs> <laughs> uh, <so, laughs> Beehive Jive. Uh, yeah. Dot com. Podcast wasn't going to be called that. Tracy's friend had a great name for the podcast. <laughs> what was the name? He called it the comb over. <laughs> <laughs> the comb over. It's very, yeah, very funny. Very funny. Made me laugh. I'm going to use that for one of my blogs coming up. <laughs> so yeah, you go to thebeehivejive.com or you can follow us on Twitter at thebeehivejive.com uh, if you want to. If you want to just ask Tr- Tracy how angry her bees are. <laughs> Well, and get some details about the funeral process too, eh? Hey? Funeral so process, yeah. So mean to The Viking uh, funeral process. Yeah, I'm going to do yeah. Pet cemetery. I'm going to make little queen burial boxes and sell them. Probably could sell them. I bet I could sell them. You probably could. Yeah, well, thanks for coming. It's really nice to talk to you. Thank you. Well, that was interesting, eh? It was kind of like... It was like being part of their, their beekeeping podcast because that's kind of pretty similar what their show's about, eh? Yeah, it's it really is a real good conversation about what they're up to. You know, what were the things that you took away from that show, Gary? Well, my key takeaways were don't freak out when you find a queen cell. I thought your key takeaway was actually barbecue pork. Are you mocking my key takeaways? <laughs> 
And why beekeeping is sometimes like being in Lord of the Rings? I'd never thought of that one before. That was a real interesting takeaway point. And in Queensland, you don't buy your honey from supermarkets? People shouldn't give up beekeeping too quickly? And Tracy's Queen Funeral Tradition honours the Queen's work. Yeah, that was funny, wasn't it? Very interesting. I know of a few beekeepers that actually collect injured bees or bees that are a bit sick and put them in a box with some honey and let them die peacefully rather than being eaten up by birds or whatever. Really? Yeah, Mm, yeah. Okay. Interesting world we live in, don't we, Gary? We do indeed. So that was a great show, and so did you enjoy that show? Did you find something useful you can use in your beekeeping work? Or help to keep you company as you work on your bees? Then you can have the next show auto-magically appear in your podcast listening device, which could be your phone, tablet, even your Apple Watch these days, I hear. Yeah, it's amazing. You can even get calls on your, on your watch these days. Man, my head just exploded. And get calls on your phone too. That's even weirder. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> anyway. I mean, if they had told me when I was in the 70s as a young kid growing up that I'd be able to look at a TV screen and someone could call me up. Well, that was on the Jetsons, remember? <laughs> Absolutely. We're living in the future, Margaret. Do, 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 do. If you want to subscribe to the show, check out kiwi.bz slash subscribe to discover lots of various ways you can subscribe to the show. And did we tell you, it's free to subscribe to the show. That's right. And it gives you the power to enjoy conversations with people like Paul and Tracy. Absolutely. And we will be back in a couple of weeks. So talk to you later and Happy New Year, everybody. Happy New Year!